Hello, this is lecture six of Symmetries, Particles and Fields. This lecture is going to be about representations of groups and of Lie algebras. Um, and these are basically some matrices um, which satisfy some relations implied by the group or the algebra. So I realized last time I advertised that we were going to do um, symmetries in quantum mechanics first. But I think it's better if we keep that um, in our back pocket until probably the next lecture. Um, we switch to this new topic of representations first. So this is chapter three. representations. So, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, a representation is uh, a set of n by n non-singular matrices. So first we'll talk about representations of groups. So square singular matrices, uh, sorry, non-singular matrices. Over some field F. So we write these matrices as um, D of G. So G are gonna be the group elements. So this is in our general linear group. Um, over of n by n matrices over the field F, uh, and G is in the group. So the idea is that every group element has a matrix associated with it. Uh, but the important thing is that um, the group products are preserved. So in other words, um, if we multiply these representation matrices from corresponding to two different group elements together, we get another representation matrix which corresponds to the group element of the product of the two elements, the original elements. So this is for all G1 and G2 in the group. Okay. Um, on the other hand, a representation of the Lie, Lie algebra is another set of n by n matrices over the field F. So we're gonna write these um, as little d of x, where x is in the Lie algebra. Um, and these have to satisfy a couple of conditions. Firstly, they must preserve the Lie bracket. Uh, and secondly, we have this um, linearity property. In other words, if we take the representation of alpha times x1 plus beta times x2, we should just get um, alpha times the representation of x1 plus beta times the representation of x2. Um, again, for all x1 and x2, in the Lie algebra and alpha and beta in the field. 
This is called linearity. So both of these uh, representation matrices, the big D and the little d's, um, they act as on some vector space. Um, and this is called the, this is an n-dimensional representation space. So we call this vector space V in general, the n-dimensional representation space. And the dimension of the representation is the dimension of the space N. So let's just look at um, a field theory application now just to get used to um, how these things might work. So um, let's stick to internal symmetries for now. For our example, um, this representation space might be might consist of fields. So for example, um, take a theory of three real scalars. So um, phi one, these are scalar quantum fields, phi one, phi two, phi three, all functions of space and time. So I'm gonna call this um, by a vector phi. It's a three component vector where each component is one of the fields. Uh, and let's say the group is SO3. So um, under the action of our group, um, what happens is these fields get rotated into each other. So um, phi under the action of G goes to the representation um, times phi, where here G is in SO3. So if SO3 is a symmetry of our theory, uh, in fact, the action has to be invariant uh, under such a change. So the action is the... Um, integral over spa all space and time of a Lagrangian density, which is composed of fields and their derivatives. Now, um, note that if we write down some transpose of our vector phi, then under G, this goes to phi transposed DG transposed, um, and for SO3, the transpose is equal to the inverse. So this is phi transposed dg to the minus one. So um, this suggests a way to build up uh, invariance of um, these, this vector, three vector of fields, phi. So if we build up phi transpose times phi under g, this goes to phi transposed dg. So minus one, dg, phi. Um, and of course, this thing is just the identity. Um, and so we have phi transpose phi. So if we build up our Lagrangian density over functions like phi transpose phi, um, each individual term will be invariant. And so um, this allows us to build a Lagrangian density which is invariant under SO3. So, okay, we're gonna write down the canonical kinetic terms now for a scalar field theory. 
And if I want in, in three plus one dimensions, um, if I want to write down all the SO3 symmetric terms um, that are consistent with renormalizability, um, then the only interaction term I can have is this final one. This uh, middle term is uh, a mass term. So this is SO3 invariant. Um, so, okay, we've not allowed the group transformations to vary with space and time. So this is a global symmetry. So G doesn't depend on um, space and time. So, uh, it's not a function of X mu. Um, so notice here, um, we've got three scalars in this uh, phi three vector. Um, and so if I expand this out, we get three mass terms, but the masses of these three scalars uh, are all the same. So notice how um, the symmetry constrains the masses to be equal. And also there's a lot of symmetry in this final term. This, this describes um, interactions between four scalar fields uh, and the SO3 is giving them all, all lots of different, uh, different options for the, uh, you know, which, which of those fields there are in these quartic couplings, but they're all proportional to this one coupling lambda. The couplings are related to. Okay, so um, we saw last time that the Lie algebra and uh, the Lie groups uh, are related. And we have a direct relation between the representations as well. You won't, as well, you won't be surprised to learn. So, um, so there exists a direct relation between d of g and little d of x. So, um, in other words, representations of the group and representations of its Lie algebra. And we're going to explore that now. So um, let's take, let's say that D uh, is a representation of G. And note that in general, um, N, which is the dimension of this representation, is not the dimension of the group necessarily. It can be in some cases, as we'll see. But uh, you, can, you, you can choose various different size matrices, um, in fact, even infinite size, to represent the group algebra, the group composition rules. So for every element of the Lie algebra, we construct a curve, C, um, which takes some parameter t to g of t with g of zero being the identity and g dot of zero being our element uh, of the Lie algebra. And we define d, uh, little d of the, the representation of the Lie algebra to be d by dt of the representation of the group element along the curve evaluated at the identity. So this is an N by N matrix over F. So little d is a representation of the Lie algebra. So we have a lemma from our setup. Um, let x1 and x2 in the, be in the Lie algebra and we construct curves C1 and C2. Um, sorry, we construct, uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, beg your pardon. Scratch that for a second. Let's start with one curve before we run into a more complicated case. So construct a curve. which takes us, oh, I was 
I wasn't that many ahead. Beg your pardon. Right. Let x1 and x2 be in the Lie algebra and construct curves C1 and C2 um, as above. So in other words, um, CI takes us from T to GI of T with GI zero is the identity and GI dot evaluated at zero um, being the element of the Lie algebra. Now I'm going to define um, I'm going to define an element of the group, and it's going to be the commutator of G one with G two. Okay, so um, we're going to do an expansion now. We'll be doing a lot of expanding this lecture, and in particular, you will be doing in your homework to work out some of the algebra. So we put uh, g i of t is i plus x i t plus w i t squared. Okay, and we're only going to we're only going to work, work to second order in t. So there's an implied plus uh, order t cube terms. All right, so um, yes. Now uh, I'm going to set uh, H of T. I'm going to expand that. Um, and so it's a group element. So when T is zero, it has to give us the identity. But um, I'm going to call the first order term in T um, H1 and the second order term H2. OK, so notice that. Um, X, I, W, I, and H, I are all matrices. So what we're going to do is expand, or what you're going to do actually, is expand G2, G1, H is equal to G1, G2. So if you expand this to um, second order in T, what you'll find is that H1 is zero and H2 is X1, X2 matrix commutator. And in fact, all of the terms involving the WIs cancel. Okay, so what this means is, of course, that H of T is I plus T squared matrix commutator of X1 and X2 plus order T cubed. So what I'm going to consider now um, is the representation corresponding to this commutator. Um, and okay, so I can expand H out. So this is D evaluated at I plus T squared, X1 comma X2 plus higher order terms. Okay, so this is, uh, now I do a Taylor expansion. So this is D of I plus T squared, D by T squared uh, of D of H of T evaluated at t equal to zero. So if you look at the way that we defined um, little d, the representation of the Lie algebra, um, it gives us that this second term is just the Lie algebra evaluated at the element x1 comma x2. Right, so um, because um, big D is a representation, um, remember we know what H is in terms of 
G1 and G2, so, um, then it follows that uh, D of H is D of G1 to the minus one, D of G2 to the minus one, D of G1, D of G2. So this is since D is a representation. Uh, now this, you have to expand yourselves. You can get a bit of additional help in the book, um, but you expand each of these representations um, up to order t squared. And you'll find when you multiply them out, you get the following. You get the commutator of the rep representations. Now, uh, I should point out that this is half a page of algebra. Uh, and actually, this is half a page as well. Nothing fancy, but uh, it's just tedious algebra. You just have to cancel a lot of terms. So um, if we look at the term proportional to t squared, actually, d of i is equal to i, of course. If I look at the, if I identify the two terms proportional to t squared here, so the two circle terms, we have that d of x1, x2 is equal to Lie bracket of dx1, or the commutator of dx1, dx2. So this is um, required for representation of the Lie algebra. Um, so the other condition we had was that uh, linearity is automatic. Uh, is linearity and li linearity because we're just dealing with matrices um, then line linearity is automatic okay so conversely given a representation of the Lie algebra we can define the representation of the group in terms of it and it's very similar to what happened with the Lie algebra itself So the group element is e to the x. Um, and in terms of this representation of the Lie algebra, it's just e to the um, representation of the Lie algebra. So actually, uh, d is a representation of the image of the exponential of the algebra. So um, the proof of this is that first uh, we notice that d of g is non-singular for all group elements. Uh, and suppose that we have two group elements, g1 and g2, which are e to the x i, each of them, e, e to the, so g1 is e to the x1 and g2 is e to the x2. So these are definitely in the image of the exponential of the Lie algebra. Okay, so then we notice that um, the representation of g1, g2 is the exponential of d x1 plus x2 plus a half x1 commutated with x2 plus other higher nested brackets. So this is using the BCH formula. Okay, and then we use linearity of um, the Lie bracket, sorry, of the Lie algebra, linearity of the Lie algebra, elements of the Lie algebra. So we have d of x1 plus d of x2, now notice that, uh, remember that the Lie bracket itself is in the Lie algebra, uh, and so that just adds on as well. And in fact, all the higher order terms 
which are also uh, are just in terms of lead brackets, um, they will also come out in, in a similar form. So I should write plus dot, dot, dot. This is linearity. Um, then I use um, BCH again to collect these into e to the d x1, e to the d x2, which is just d, it's the representation of the group element corresponding to g1 times the representation of the group element corresponding to d2. And of course, this is the property that we need for a representation of a group. So this is good. It's hanging together so far anyway. All right. So in our example before, um, we have this uh, three representation of SO3. Um, this is sloppy notation, really, um, but this is what physicists do. So in our SO3 field theory example, um, we say, this three vector phi is in the three representation of SO3. So strictly speaking, we should say it's in the represent is in the three-dimensional representation space. But I will no doubt um, slip into um, using that moniker as well. So um, as we kind of mentioned before, for a given group, um, there can be many different representations of the Lie algebra or of the group, and they've all got different, num different dimensions. I should say there can be many different reps of L of G, for instance, with different numbers of dimensions. So each one comes with a an associated representation of the group via the exponential map. Which we just saw. Um, I want to give you some important examples of representations now. Firstly, um, if we take representation, which is just an n by n zero matrix. Um, so when we exponentiate that, we just get that the representation of the group is the identity matrix the n by n one for all members of the group. Uh, this is the trivial representation. Okay. Um, so if we if G is a matrix group, which we'll often be concerned with, Uh, and it's defined in terms of n by n matrices, matrices. Then uh, just taking the representation to be the group element, 
So this is actually what I did in the SO3 example. I just gave you an SO3 matrix. This is called the fundamental representation. And it's n-dimensional. So for um, the Lie algebra of SON, um, the fundamental rep D of X is the space of real anti-symmetric N by N matrices. And in, this is as we saw before. So for um, the algebra of SUN, um, it's these it's the anti Hermitian and by matrices. Okay, thirdly, different representation uh, and one that's going to be important is this adjoint rep. So every group G has an adjoint rep. So this plays a special role. In some sense, it's the natural representation uh, of the group on the Lie algebra. So we're going to write this one, this adjoint rep um, of the group with uh, a suffix add. And so it's going to be, um, of course, a, a function, you know, it depends on which group element you're talking about. And it acts on an element of the Lie algebra. So this we're going to call, we'll also sometimes call it um, just add G acting on X. And this is G, X, G to the minus one. So this is where the group, uh, G is in the group and X is in the Lie algebra of the group. So we have to check that this is a representation. Since, um, well, if we take the adjoint of G1, G2 on X, this is equal to, um, G1, G2, X, G1, G2 to the minus one. Okay, um, and okay, so if I just uh, look at this final bracketed inverse here, we get G2 to the minus one, G1 to the minus one. Um, and this is the same as add the adjoint of G1 acting on the adjoint g2 acting on x as required so it follows the necessary rule for the representation of a group um, and it closes um, we have to check that it closes and we're going to do that now but it closes because we're going to show as we're going to show that g x g to the minus one is in the Lie algebra of the group the proof of this is there exists a curve g of t is i plus t x plus some of the terms in in the group with tangent x at t equal to zero. So then um, I define another curve, which is um, g times g of t times g to the minus one. Uh, so this is another curve in the group. 
And if I expand out g of t by expanding out just g, I get i plus t g x g to the minus one plus order t squared. Um, and so this has tangent given by the coefficient of t at the, at the identity. Um, and of course, the, the, this tangent is in the, has to be, at the identity has to be by definition in the Lie algebra. And the representation space um, of this adjoint rep is um, the Lie algebra of itself. Okay, so now let's um, talk about the adjoint representation of the Lie algebra. And so now we call this little d of adjoint of acting on some x. This is also defined to be little ad suffix x for all x in the Lie algebra. So um, we have a definition of adjoint representation suffix x acting on y. This is a, the Lie bracket between x and y for all y in the Lie group, in the um, Lie algebra. So let's, as we did a few lectures ago, let's choose a basis again. Um, so this is going to be set of matrices TA, where A goes from one to the dimension of the group. Um, so this is a basis for the Lie algebra. And x, our element of the Lie algebra in general is this x, a, t, a. So it's just some linear combinations of these t, a's. Um, and then y also is y, a, t, a. Then uh, we can ask what the seeth component of and x, uh, suffix x of y is. So this means um, the component in the t, c direction. So this is equal to, um, well, if we just use the definition uh, of this, uh, the adjoint, this is x, y, c component. Uh, so we can just substitute in for x and y now, uh, and we get x, x, a, and y, b are just coefficients, but we have a non-trivial commutator for the TAs. Uh, and we want to find the seeth component of that commutator. But luckily, we have the Lie algebra to input for the commutator. And so this is just the structure constants Fc, AB. So this is um, dimension G times dimension G matrix. And we need to prove that um, this d adj um, is, is a representation of the Lie algebra. We need to check that um, d adj, sorry, I should have put a j there, uh, is a representation of the Lie algebra. So we need to check that the commutator of the reps so acting on some z um, 
gives us the representation of the commutator of the elements. So, all right. So this is adjoint x, adjoint y, minus adjoint y, adjoint x, acting on z. Um, so if I just use the definition uh, of the adjoint here, in terms of the Lie brackets, I get x comma, uh, the commutator of x with the commutator of y and z minus y comma, the commutator of x with z. So we use the Jacobi identity now to get that this is equal to commutator of x and y with z. So this is the adjoint corresponding to the element x, y acting on z, which indeed is our matrix corresponding to the Lie bracket acting on z. So we've proved that um, these d -adge -adge form, form representation matrices of the Lie algebra. Okay. So let's have an example. Um, let's take Lie algebra of SU2. So remember, we looked at this before, and the Lie algebra is as follows. So our structure constants were these epsilons. Um, and so D adjoint of X C B is X A F C A B, um, which is just this epsilon. So we can put this equal to X A times um, an adjoint rep basis matrices. So I'll call these T adjoint A. In other words, we set it, set this, this thing equal to X A times T adjoint A, and it's the C B component. So um, we've identified what T A C B is. It's this epsilon A C B, thus, T1 adjoint is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0. T2 adjoint is 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And T3 adjoint is 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, and three zeros. And we've already seen this. Um, this is the fundamental three representation of, of SO3. Okay, good. So um, I just want to cover one small topic um, and then we're at the end of the lecture. And uh, this small topic is about isomorphic representations. So it's really just a definition. So if two n-dimensional representations, let's call them D and D prime. So these are representations of the group. So if these are related by D of G is S, D of G, and S to the minus one for all G in the group. Um, and S being an N by N invertible matrix, 
the two representations D and D prime, uh, which I missed the prime off. They're said to be either isomorphic or equivalent representations. So if you think about it, really, um, these representation matrices act on basis vectors. And all we're doing here um, is changing the basis of the representation space. Now, the same uh, is true of elements of the Lie algebra. So in other words, um, if I replace D of G by D of X and uh, D prime of G by uh, D prime of X um, for all X in the Lie algebra, then they're also said to be um, isomorphic or equivalent representations with the same conditions on S. Okay, good. So next time we're going to start off um, presenting how you can combine uh, some representations to make new ones. We'll also look at, um, we'll, do, we'll cover this topic of symmetries in quantum mechanics and look at how, at how that uh, relates to representations too. See you then.